Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, reads as follows. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers, teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, doing, and understanding of his most holy word. Today I want to talk to you about the great falling away. The great falling away. It says to promote its prosperity. It's speaking of this church as we read that section. To promote its prosperity and spirituality. We're promising to promote its prosperity and spirituality. We're promising to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine. But in order to preach this word, the Lord led me to the book of Ephesians. To the word that it is believed Paul gave to the church at Ephesus. The people who lived in Ephesus were known as Ephesians. Ephesus at the time was the fourth largest uh, city at that day and time. It was also a city that was filled with pagan worshipers, the worshipers of false gods, the god, small g, the god of choice was Diana. And they were in large part devoted to Diana. Nonetheless, a church was founded in Ephesus. This church began to do a mighty work. It had great pastors who taught them what thus saith the Lord. Also about Ephesus, Jesus wrote a letter to Ephesus. That letter was shown in the book of Revelations. And in there he says, you've done some great things. You've done some things that have made me happy. You've done some things that have put a smile on my face. But he said, but I have somewhat against you. I, I've, got some, I've got some things against you. You left your first love. When, when he's saying that, what he's saying is, you, you have left your former devotion to God. You, you, you loved me a lot at the beginning, but then you began to fall away. Right. He said, I have something somewhat against you. Church, 
we are experiencing too a great falling away. Have you noticed? I'm not talking about just South Calvary. But I am including South Calvary. Back in the day, even before my day, I, I, I understand that on Sunday mornings, the church spent the day worshiping and fellowshipping one with the other. You, you got up in the morning and you came to Sunday morning worship service, which included Sunday school. Actually, at that time, early in that time, it was actually school uh -huh. that happened on Sunday. And then it moved into the worship service. And then from the worship service, when it was all said and done, then we would fellowship together. Or we would break bread and we would eat and enjoy each other's company together. Uh -huh. We would invite a another church over, and they would break bread with us. Everybody brought something from home and, and pitched in. And we enjoyed each other's company and fellowship. And then after that was all said and done, then there was the second watch. The second watch of the day. with that visiting church, with that fellowship. But now, most of us have already set in your heart that you're not going to the afternoon service that we haven't even announced yet. <laughs> I'm not going. You, you tell me when and where. And I won't be there. There's been a great following away. We, we, don't, we don't host afternoon services anymore. Not, not just for fellowship. There's got to be a reason. We have taken our quote unquote special days. And moved them from an afternoon service. And squeezed them in to the Sunday morning worship service for our convenience. We don't do Bible study anymore. We don't do prayer meetings anymore. We don't do BTU anymore. We don't want to come back for rehearsal anymore. We don't make teach our children to learn their memory verses anymore. Many of us don't even bless our food before we eat. If we're in the choir, we don't want to sing on every Sunday. That would be too much. If we're a Sunday school teacher, we don't want to teach on every Sunday. That would be too much. If we ushers, we don't want to usher every Sunday. That would be too much. But Paul told the Romans, he told the Romans that you are to present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. And then he said this. For this is your reasonable service. Yeah. Why is it reasonable? Because if you are a child of God. Yeah. Your body is not your own. Why? You have been bought with a price. But church folks. Y'all, y'all, sly as a fox. 
<laughs> Sly as a fox. Church folks, don't tell you that what you're saying and what you're doing is unreasonable. They don't say that. They don't say that it's unreasonable. Um, what, 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 what church folk do is they stay real quiet. And they don't disagree. And then when the time comes, they just don't show. Nobody said anything. Nobody complained. We just wasn't there. What's happened is some of our hearts have become as hard as stone. Some of our hearts have, have become as cold as ice. You've determined already in your head. I saw your faces when I talked to you earlier. There's some things I'm just not going to do. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter how much scripture you read at me. It doesn't matter how much Jesus you speak at me. I'm not going to love that neighbor. I'm not going to forgive my enemy. I am not going to inconvenience myself with a 24-hour fast. I'm not coming to Bible study. I'm not coming to Sunday school. I'm not going to show up at all the rehearsals. And you can keep on talking about the perfect worship experience. All you want, I'm not going to help. It doesn't matter what you say, John. I'm not gonna do it. And I would caution you about that. I would caution you about having such a hard heart. Because the Bible tells about another man who had a hard heart. And, and, and his name was, they called him Pharaoh. And God sent his prophet to go tell Pharaoh what he wanted him to do. But Pharaoh would not listen to God either. Pharaoh wouldn't do it either. Then God said, well, I've got a way to make you change your mind and soften your heart. I've got a way of doing it. And there was a consequence that came to Pharaoh and it cost him dearly. My suggestion, John's suggestion, is that you stop rejecting God. Stop trying to make your point about how you are in control of your own life. He wants to be of high priority in your life, higher than you put yourself. Because, y'all, this is a fight you are not going to win. You might get your way, but be prepared to pay the consequence of your disobedience. I say all that because as a church, we have left our first love. We've left our first love. And Jesus said, I have somewhat against you. Why? Because you have not matured spiritually. But one day, 
standing outside those doors, and um, Shakita's son and daughter, Jesse and Eden, were out there with me. And, 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 and Jesse said to me, uh, standing outside, he pointed in the sanctuary, he said, who's in there? I thought that it was an opportunity to, to, uh, to, to teach. And I, I said, well, well, that's where God is. Jesse wouldn't come in the room. Eden ran down the stairs. See, what, what I was doing, I, I was speaking to them spiritually. But they, they couldn't understand it any way other than physically. Why? Because they were not yet spiritually mature. Sometimes, y'all, sometimes we miss what the Lord is telling us because we are not spiritually mature. Bible tells a situation where Jesus was speaking to the Jewish leaders. And as he talked to them, as he spoke to them, he said this. He said that, uh, that he said, I, will, I can tear down this temple and build it back up in three days. And they got mad. How can you do that? They were talking about the building. He was talking about this body. They were thinking physical and he was talking spiritual. Right after that, right after that, Jesus met a man at nighttime. Met a man uh, named Nicodemus. And he told Nicodemus, he said that if you want to live, then you're going to have to be born again. Nicodemus looked at him and he said, how could I be born again? How could I could go back into my mother's womb? But he was talking physical, but Jesus was talking spiritual. He left that place and he went to a well. There was a woman at the well. He, he met the woman and, and they had a conversation. And, and then uh, he asked her for a drink of water. She said, you asking water from me? He said, if you knew who you were talking to. And if you knew the gift of God, you would be asking me for water. And I would give you eternal, everlasting water. Yeah, yeah. Amen. She looked at me and said, well, how are you going to give me that? Where are you going to get that? You don't even have a ladle. Because she was thinking physical. And Jesus was speaking in the spiritual. No, none of them could understand what he was saying because they were not yet spiritually mature. Many of you have been in the church all your life. So let me ask you this. Don't answer out loud. How spiritually mature are you? You do understand this. Some of y'all are giving yourself credit. Credit is not necessarily due. Because there are levels of spiritual maturity and levels of spiritual immaturity. I just talked to you about an extreme with Jesse and Eden. But, but, but watch this. Some of us understand, we already understand that God 
is in this place. We, we understand that. We know that. But, but we say, I know he's in the place. But the thing is, I know this, that he's only here in spirit. And since he's only here in spirit, while I'm in this room, I'm going to do everything I want to do anyhow in the physical. That's why, even to this day, I still find people in the sanctuary chewing gum. I still see people in the sanctuary playing games on their phones. I still see people in the sanctuary. I've heard people in the sanctuary. I've heard it cuss and swear. Now they're saying because I know that the Lord is in this place. This is God's house. They think that makes them spiritually mature. It's all still spiritual immaturity. You, you see, many people believe that since he's only here spiritually, then he might as well be a million miles away. And, and if God himself, if God himself grabbed you by the hand, walked you in this room, sat you down on a seat, and then sat right next to you, would you still be chewing gum? Would you still be playing games on your phone? Would you still be cussing and swearing? Can I tell you something? God is a spirit. And everything he does is in the spirit. And God did grab you by the hand. And God did walk you in this room. And God did sit you down where you're sitting right now. And guess what? God is sitting right next to you even this very moment. But because some of us can't see him, he might as well be a million miles away. That's spiritual immaturity. We're falling away. We're falling away because over the course of time, we're becoming less mature. We're becoming less mature spiritually. And because of it, Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, I have somewhat against you. He told them then, he said, I want you to remember, repent, and return. Remember your former devotion to me. And then he said, repent from your lack of love and devotion from me. And then he said, return to where you know you should be. So the text that we read, the text is telling us that Jesus is the head of the church. Take good care. You, the church, you take good care of his body. Jesus is the head of the church. You take good care of his body, the church being the body of Christ. In the line of the covenant, you are promising that because Jesus is the head of the church, you're promising that you will take good care of his body. And you're promising that you will help the church to grow, become more financially strong. Pins dropping. You're promising that you will help this church become financially strong. You're promising that you will grow to be spiritually mature and help others to do the same. You're promising to help South Calvary be a church where that worships God the way that God wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. In spirit. That your worship will come from your heart. And in truth, according to his holy word, according to his ordinances, 
according to his disciplines, according to his doctrines, as they are found in his holy word. You have a duty of care. Each member has a duty of care to your local church. And when we read, when we reread our covenant, you are renewing your promise. Promise that you made in the presence of God, angels, and every member in this assembly. You made a promise that you would not shirk your responsibilities. What does it mean to shirk your responsibilities? To, it, it means to shirk means to, uh, to actively avoid or push off. You're a member of this church. This is your church. I'm the pastor, but every one of us has responsibilities in this church. Can I tell you what? I'm going to vent for a moment. Tell you what burns me up. It's, it's a conversation that if you called me up that you would not know it over the phone. This is an after the phone hangs up conversation. That somebody comes up to me, this actually happened. Somebody came up to me, I was in my study, and they came up the stairs into my study, and they said, Pastor, there's paper all over the front lawn. <laughs> and once again, the conversation after they left, and you walk past it? <laughs> People call me up to put things on my to-do list. Everything, y'all, I don't mind. I don't mind. I want to know what's going on. But here's, bring me solutions, not problems. It's your church, too. leaders, as ministry leaders, you are responsible for and trusted with equipping those in your care with the work of the ministry. You're responsible for it. You're responsible for, you're responsible for leading them in how to provide perfect worship. If your ministry members are providing the same kind, the same level of service now that they were at the beginning of the year, you, ministry leader, have shirked your responsibilities. And if you've shirked your responsibilities, you have failed. And if you have failed, then I as the under shepherd have not properly equipped you for the work of ministry and I have shirked my responsibilities. I have failed you and I have failed God. It's okay to make a mistake once. It's not acceptable to keep making the same mistake over and over again. So every month we renew our promise to take good care of the body of Christ. We renew our promise not to shirk our responsibility. That's why in this church you cannot, you cannot serve in a position of leadership unless you are an active member of Sunday school and or Bible study. You, you can't do it. Don't please, 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 don't ask. Don't make me say it 
to your face. Because if you, if you won't, if you won't, if you, leader, if you won't, if you won't take care of your own spiritual growth and development, why would I put you in responsibility of a bunch of other people? There's a great falling away at the church. A great falling away. But y'all, there's something about a comeback. There's something, y'all, there's something special about a comeback. 1995. Playoff game. Indiana Pacers versus the New York Knicks. 18 seconds left in the game. Pacers are down by six points. 105 to 99. They throw the ball in. It lands in Reggie Miller's hand. Reggie steps behind the three-point line, shoots that ball in the air, swish. Nothing the next. The crowd goes wild, even in New York. <laughs> New York takes the ball out again. They throw it. They miss the person who they were going to. It lands once again in the hands of Reggie Miller. Reggie runs back to the three-point line, throws the ball up, swish. Nothing but net. Game time. When they throw the ball back in, there's a foul. New York goes to the line on the other side. John Stark, who is a 75% free throw shooter, stands at the line, misses the first one, and then misses the second one. The ball lands in the hands of Reggie Miller. Reggie goes down to the other end, shoots two free throws, Pacers go up by two. Reggie hits eight points in nine seconds. And the Pacers win. Yeah. Y'all, there's something about a comeback. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about a comeback. Y'all, we are the body of Christ. Yeah. We are the church of the living God. We are the ecclesia. We are a called out assembly. We are the ones that God brought out of the darkness yeah. into his marvelous light. Yeah. We are God's vehicle to change the whole world. And y'all, if God be for us, Amen. if God be for us, Amen. church, if God be for us, who can be against us? That's why y'all, I'll be honest with you, I'm not happy with when we fall away, but I'm not worried about a fall away. I'm just looking forward to a comeback. I'm looking forward to a comeback. Y'all, because it's not about the fall. It's about the comeback. Remember Rocky? In rounds one through nine, he got beat down. He got pushed around. He got knocked down. But in round 10, it was all about the comeback. That's the way it is with Jesus. No, that's the way it is with Jesus. Jesus was betrayed into the hands of sinful men. Oh, he got beat down. He got pushed around. He got knocked down. And it all happened on a hill called Calvary between two thieves with the crown of thorns on his head, with nails in his hands, with nails in his feet, with blood flowing down. Y'all, he died on that side, on that hill. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But y'all, then came the 10th round. 
Then came the tenth round. Early on a Sunday morning. Early on a Sunday morning. It was all about the comeback. God raised him from the dead. The fall away was necessary. But the power was in the comeback. Yeah. Guess what? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, uh -huh. when the last trumpet sounds, he's coming back again. Just like he said he would. So I just want us to be ready. I just want us to be ready when he comes back. God bless you, church.